doesn't that come I think that's a little a bit of a mistake because I there, yeah. mistake, there are actually parts true. of of Trump's agenda that I don't agree the drug pricing and stuff that I worry about but that's popular among Democrats so it'd be very interesting if he mentions that something right. that's more a democratic kind of criminal approach. justice and they reform? don't go to it and right. they don't go to it I, I mean look they they have to suffer through this evening. It's like your mother dressing you up mm -hmm. and you have to go well, to your aunt's party. We have to suffer party. through their impeachment. We had right. to suffer through their democratic <laughs> debates. I mean, hours of But they kind of have to sit there and they have to just get through it. And I, I think it doesn't help them if they behave boorishly. That's what I'm wondering, because it makes them look like right. people that are rooting against the United States. They sure are, though. We say it's right. like validate what well, we that, They want a recession. You know they want a recession. They're, I think that was, I, I, had a, I had a column today in the journal, and that was my point. Trump, if you get past the insults, because uh, so many people are distracted, like he he says Michael Bloomberg is short, and it Which go is a fact. I was gonna say, but it, it goes yeah. the entire tall. the entire United States press, every newspaper then writes an article about Bloomberg being short, right? If you get past that, you look. What is he selling? He's selling American greatness and optimism. About, it's it's Reagan esque the optimism. He's not Reagan and. He's, Reagan was a little more genial and some of this willing to turn the other cheek. But it is essentially the same optimism about the American worker. And the Democrats' problem is they haven't figured out a way to attack Donald Trump without either sneering at his supporters as deplorables right. or sneering at American greatness, the idea. It looks like they're all wearing white again. again. They're all doing, but you know who's also in white? Condoleezza Rice, I think. Maybe that was I an accident. See her. Was that her in white? I don't know. I'm not I sure. Don't know. I saw that front row okay. shot. She would what, not have done that. What was the that. white thing again? Is that uh, Me Too? Uh, is I, that, I, is that what that is? I thought it was black for Me Too at the Oscars. So it I don't was black, know. but then last year I think they wore white as they well. They were white last, last year. Last year was yeah. white. Women's equality. But you know what? I saw not not all of them are wearing white. I saw uh, Kirsten Cinema not wearing white. So we're sending another message that this is a divide. This is us, and this is you, and we are not the same, and we are against you, and here's how we shall stand. I mean, stand. I love a good well, white, but I, I mean, mean, Diddy has a white party. This is not that. Uh, <laughs> Diddy's white party. Definitely not that. Well, here, I look, it looks like he's experience. about ready to walk through right. the door any, any time now. We're awaiting our president. By the way, something else about this, you know, the, you asked about the points at which they could applaud her. Kamala, she's Kamala wearing, is not she's wearing, wearing white. She's wearing the Steve Jobs. Look yeah. at that. She's got a turtleneck on. She is giving a nod to Steve Jobs over there. She's going to start mouthing, I want to be vice president. Well, that's Biden's. I, I, I want to talk to you guys about that as well. Do you think Biden taps Kamala as his VP if he can stay awake long enough to get through the rest of these primaries? I don't think he can make it. If he's, Would he get fourth in, in the early Iowa he fourth? Looks fourth yeah. It's not a good and look. Pete is. They're all not, you know, nobody really did great, but Pete was at, what, 26 I think Buzos did pretty good from where he yeah. was to be right. in the first place to have the most. Well, Bernie ever. getting, coming in second, second. it right. looked like. I mean, I think everybody kind of thought it was going to be Bernie Biden. Well, he did win the popular, he has right. more popular votes than right. Buzos. Right. Feel the burn, know. Bernie. You will not be the candidate. You don't think? No. So you Pete? Do, does no. anybody, I know that they've been talking about it all day, and this is yesterday, but while we have some moments, I want to get Bill's take on this too. The debacle that was last night. Right. They're saying this is just the app went down, which I don't disagree with. But yeah. do you think that this makes people, especially the Bernie bros, kind of look at what happened and say, did the app really go down or we, did we do too well? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of his supporters that are going to say that it feeds it. Look, when something goes wrong like that, it just feeds acrimony. Mm -hmm. Right, and and there's a legitimate um, grievance that the candidates have. If you plowed everything into they're like Pete Buttigieg or Amy Klobuchar, and you did well, you're kind of robbed of your moment because the right. moment is right. when all your workers who've been drinking cold coffee and eating stale pizza, they're there, and you say we we won, and you're denied. It's just not going to have the same push. Right. Yeah. By the Momentum way, Bernie, lost. fun fact: at the uh, cellular arena where he had his supporters gathered last night. The opening act, Vampire Weekend. This is from a guy trying to sell you socialism, which sucks the life out of society. And Vamp his opening band is Vampire Weekend. They're pretty good. Just want to share that with the Fox Nation audience. Well, and that was good. I mean, I we appreciate those, 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 those fun <laughs> facts. But still, even, you know, Bernie had a big crowd, but his crowds were still smaller than the lines to the bathroom at a Trump rally. But there we see Melania. Looking gorgeous as ever. There's Laura Elliott. Here it goes. 
Do you guys think that Melania, I mean, we know she doesn't get the credit she deserves, but compared to other first ladies, she's rather quiet. That's, I expected maybe her to change somewhat in well, she's actually got to run a life that exists outside the White right. House. Which I respect of her because she's a young not, son. Yeah, she's and, and she only has there. five staffers, not 42 like Michelle did. Yeah, we're hearing it. I think it's coming in live, so I think we're going to. Take a listen. But we're still going to talk because they're just clapping. Um, as far as moving forward, Will the Democrats work with this president on things that you think would be bipartisan, like infrastructure, or do they just want to make sure he doesn't get another win? Uh, Mike Pompeo coming in. Steve Mnuchin. Uh, Steve behind him. So, uh, yeah, we're just watching everybody walk in. But, yeah, um, David, to my question, will they work with this president? He's going to lay out his vision for the country that uh, some areas that should be bipartisan. You mentioned drug prices and things like infrastructure and even continue to work on our trade deals. Do they work with him in this, over this next several months, or do we just continue the obstruction? If the party were to try to come back somewhat center, at least in appearance, they would probably work with the president. They tried to take credit for the USMCA by timing it, but they mm -hmm. couldn't. They delayed it for a year. Uh, but the fact is they've been dragged so far left that now it's about a movement. Bernie, AOC, and all the others are really leading this party through a movement change. And I think right now if they realize that they cannot beat Trump, then they have to continue to just simply fight against Trump. And so to I keep don't their expect, base energized, because if they don't, their base is completely gone. But it's a dwindling gone. base, to Bill's point, and I think it's really more about changing the party long term. Right. The Democrats really adopt the policy at the ends, not necessarily the election cycle. That's not good for the country, though, because what this ends up being is an entrenched fight. And it points to the importance of at least getting the Republicans back in control of the House so that President Trump and the administration can push the Republicans to actually keep working on the right things. He doesn't need another Paul Ryan in there telling him he doesn't have the vote for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. He does need to work on some of the more reticent Republicans that are there, the, the Paul Singer-supported Republicans, the Tom Donahue wing, the Open Borders wing, and others. He needs to work on these policies. So... You know, it, it's basic. Either they're entrenched and they fight, or they try to move forward if, and pull it back to a peer center. Yeah, I slightly. I'm not sure their base is dwindling. Um, Hillary Clinton again won the popular vote. We're in a very polarized country. The latest approval ratings for Donald Trump, very good news for him, 49 mm -hmm. percent. But 50 percent are either opposed or strongly. We're a very divided nation. So, I don't know. I think the Democrats are in a jam. Look. The president was impeached and he signed the, the trade deal. I mean, that normally doesn't, when you're impeached or facing impeachment, you're considered weak and so forth. But because the Democrats had been seen to just be obstructionist and not have anything to take to the voters that we did it, they had to give him that. I don't know whether that means they'll have to give him a few more. They'll try to give him as few as possible. But they risk, you know, especially in those Trump districts, that are responsible for giving the Democrat uh, congressmen that give Mrs. Pelosi her majority, that, you know, the, the total obstruction may not be what people like. That's what people think Washington is, well, and they don't like it. But what about the voting electorate? We've talked about the candidates and the parties a lot, but what about the actual electorate that's out there? It's changing. The generational change is happening. Well, what did we see the last vote. night when they, in, in Iowa they expected 26 or they expected 20, 2008 level attendance or turnout and they got 2016 level. So to me that tells you that the, the party is not energized but it also tells you a lot of people in Iowa are voting for Trump. Right. And so I think that's why their Democrats are voting for Trump. And then when you looked at the Democrat pundits on TV today they just pointed to racism. About to make his entrance. And there's that looks like the sergeant at arms right there. Yeah. Yep, here we go. This president's red tie. Yeah. All right, here, give me a, when this is when we get the announcement. I always wonder how he gets that voice. He really <laughs> gets it out there. <laughs> <laughs> The gavel, by the way, by the speaker. Madam the Speaker, the President of the United States.
That's pretty relaxed. I think you get excited about these things. He is. He, 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 he definitely is. He loves the attention, which is fine. I, mean, I don't know why we look to that as a bad thing. Obama loved attention, too. But right. People just thought it was the greatest thing. Obama loved himself. Don't get it twisted. You know, there's something else, too. you got to remember who the president is. He's a builder. When the building's up and you're about to cut the ribbon, mm -hmm. this is one of those moments. You can take those accomplishments, your building's open, you're walking in with the scissors, you know, Nancy walked with the gavel. Trump's walking in with, metaphorically with the scissors to cut and open a new building. And it's an adrenaline. He loves it. People always ask me, how is he in real life since I knew him from The Apprentice? And he's the same exact person I see today. He is not one I ever different. He's just a little funnier than you see him on TV. He had a ridiculous sense of humor. Let's get to show that. Let's listen in because our, our president is about to speak about the great American comeback. After the stadium, we'll be back with our thoughts and our reaction. Here we go for Donald J. Trump. Greeting the justices. All right. Members of Congress, the President of the United States. Madam Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, the First Lady of the United States. <laughs> and my fellow citizens, Three years ago, we launched the Great American Comeback. Tonight, I stand before you to share the incredible results. Jobs are booming, incomes are soaring, poverty is plummeting, crime is falling, confidence is surging, and our country is thriving and highly respected again. America's enemies are on the run, America's fortunes are on the rise, and America's future is blazing bright. The years of economic decay are over.
the days of our country being used, taken advantage of, and even scorned by other nations are long behind us. Gone, too, are the broken promises, jobless recoveries, tired platitudes, and constant excuses for the depletion of American wealth, power, and prestige. In just three short years, we have shattered the mentality of American decline, and we have rejected the downsizing of Americans' destiny. We have totally rejected the downsizing. We are moving forward at a pace that was unimaginable just a short time ago, and we are never, ever going back. I am thrilled to report to you tonight that our economy is the best it has ever been. Our military is completely rebuilt, with its power being unmatched anywhere in the world, and it's not even close. Our borders are secure. Our families are flourishing. Our values are renewed. Our pride is restored. And for all of these reasons, I say to the people of our great country, and to the members of Congress, the state of our union is stronger than ever before. The vision I will lay out this evening demonstrates how we are building the world's most prosperous and inclusive society, one where every citizen can join in America's unparalleled success and where every community can take part in America's extraordinary rise. From the instant I took office, I moved rapidly to revive the U.S. economy, slashing a record number of job-killing regulations, enacting historic and record-setting tax cuts, and fighting for fair and reciprocal trade agreements. Our agenda is relentlessly pro-worker, pro-family, pro-growth, and most of all, pro-American. Thank you. We are advancing with unbridled optimism and lifting our citizens of every race, color, religion, and creed very, very high. Since my election, we have created 7 million new jobs, 5 million more than government experts projected during the previous administration. The unemployment rate is the lowest in over half a century. And very incredibly, the average unemployment rate under my administration is lower than any administration in the history of our country. Yeah. If we hadn't reversed the failed economic policies of the previous administration, the world would not now be witnessing this great economic success. The unemployment rate for African Americans 
Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans has reached the lowest levels in history. African-American youth unemployment has reached an all-time low. African-American poverty has declined to the lowest rate ever recorded. The unemployment rate for women reached the lowest level in almost 70 years, and last year, women filled 72 percent of all new jobs added. The veterans' unemployment rate dropped to a record low. The unemployment rate for disabled Americans has reached an all-time low. <laughs> Workers without a high school diploma have achieved the lowest unemployment rate recorded in U.S. history. A record number of young Americans are now employed. <laughs> Under the last administration, more than 10 million people were added to the food stamp rolls. Under my administration, 7 million Americans have come off food stamps, and 10 million people have been lifted off of welfare. In eight years under the last administration, over 300,000 working-age people dropped out of the workforce. In just three years of my administration, 3.5 million people, working-age people, have joined the workforce. Since my election, the net worth of the bottom half of wage earners has increased by 47 percent, three times faster than the increase for the top 1 percent. After decades of flat and falling incomes, wages are rising fast, and wonderfully, they are rising fastest for low-income workers who have seen a 16 percent pay increase since my election. <laughs> this is a blue-collar boom. Real median household income is now at the highest level ever recorded. Since my election, U.S. stock markets have soared 70 percent, adding more than $12 trillion to our nation's wealth, transcending anything anyone believed was possible. This is a record. It is something that every country in the world is looking up to. They admire. <laughs> Consumer confidence has just reached amazing new highs. 
All of those millions of people with 401ks and pensions are doing far better than they have ever done before, with increases of 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100 percent, and even more. Jobs and investments are pouring into 9,000 previously neglected neighborhoods thanks to Opportunity Zones, a plan spearheaded by Senator Tim Scott as part of our great Republican tax cuts. In other words, wealthy people and companies are pouring money into poor neighborhoods or areas that haven't seen investment in many decades, creating jobs, energy, and excitement. This is the first time that these deserving communities have seen anything like this. It's all working. Opportunity Zones are helping Americans like Army veteran Tony Rankins from Cincinnati, Ohio. After struggling with drug addiction, Tony lost his job, his house, and his family. He was homeless. But then Tony found a construction company that invests in Opportunity Zones. He is now a top tradesman, drug-free, reunited with his family, and he is here tonight. Tony, keep up the great work, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Our roaring economy has, for the first time ever, given many former prisoners the ability to get a great job and a fresh start. This second chance at life is made possible because we passed landmark criminal justice reform into law. Everybody said that criminal justice reform couldn't be done, but I got it done, and the people in this room got it done. Thanks to our bold regulatory reduction campaign, the United States has become the number one producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world, by far. With the tremendous progress we have made over the past three years, America is now energy independent, and energy jobs, like so many other elements of our country, are at a record high. We are doing numbers that no one would have thought possible just three years ago. Likewise, we are restoring our nation's manufacturing might, even though predictions were, as you all know, that this could never, ever be done. After losing 60,000 factories under the previous two administrations, America has now gained 12,000 new factories under my administration, with thousands upon thousands of plants and factories being planned or being built. Companies are not leaving. They are coming back to the USA. The fact is that everybody wants to be where the action is, and the United States of America is indeed the place where the action is. One of the biggest promises I made to the American people was to replace the disastrous NAFTA trade deal.
In fact, unfair trade is perhaps the single biggest reason that I decided to run for president. Following NAFTA's adoption, our nation lost one in four manufacturing jobs. Many politicians came and went pledging to change or replace NAFTA, only to do so, and then absolutely nothing happened. But unlike so many who came before me, I keep my promises. We did our job. Six days ago, I replaced NAFTA and signed the brand-new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement into law. The USMCA will create nearly 100,000 new high-paying American auto jobs and massively boost exports for our farmers, ranchers, and factory workers. It will also bring trade with Mexico and Canada to a much higher level, but also to be a much greater degree of fairness and reciprocity. We will have that fairness and reciprocity. And I say that finally because it's been many, many years that we were treated fairly on trade. This is the first major trade deal in many years to earn the strong backing of America's labor unions. I also promised our citizens that I would impose tariffs to confront China's massive theft of America's jobs. Our strategy has worked. Days ago, we signed the groundbreaking new agreement with China that will defend our workers, protect our intellectual property, bring billions and billions of dollars into our Treasury, and open vast new markets for products made and grown right here in the USA. For decades, China has taken advantage of the United States. Now we have changed that. But at the same time, we have perhaps the best relationship we've ever had with China, including with President Xi. They respect what we've done because, quite frankly, they could never really believe that they were able to get away with what they were doing year after year, decade after decade, without someone in our country stepping up and saying, that's enough. Now we want to rebuild our country, and that's exactly what we're doing. We are rebuilding our country. As we restore American leadership throughout the world, we are once again standing up for freedom in our hemisphere. That's why my administration reversed the failing policies of the previous administration on Cuba. We are supporting the hopes of Cubans, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans to restore democracy. The United States is leading a 59-nation diplomatic coalition against the socialist dictator of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. <laughs> Maduro is an illegitimate ruler, a tyrant who brutalizes his people, but Maduro's grip on tyranny will be smashed and broken. Here this evening is a very brave man who carries with him the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of all Venezuelans. Joining us in the gallery is the true and legitimate President of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. <laughs> Mr. President, please take this message back to your family.
Thank you, Mr. President. Great honor. Thank you very much. Please take this message back that all Americans are united with the Venezuelan people in their righteous struggle for freedom. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Socialism destroys nations, but always remember, freedom unifies the soul. <laughs> to safeguard American liberty, we have invested a record-breaking $2.2 trillion in the United States military. We have purchased the finest planes, missiles, rockets, ships, and every other form of military equipment, and it's all made right here in the USA. We are also getting our allies, finally, to help pay their fair share. I have raised contributions from other NATO members by more than $400 billion, and the number of allies meeting their minimum obligations has more than doubled. And just weeks ago, for the first time since President Truman established the Air Force, more than 70 years earlier, we created a brand-new branch of the United States Armed Forces. It's called the Space Force. Very important. In the gallery tonight, we have a young gentleman and what he wants so badly, 13 years old, Ian Lonfay. He's an eighth grader from Arizona. Ian, please stand up. Ian has always dreamed of going to space. He was the first in his class and among the youngest at an aviation academy. He aspires to go to the Air Force Academy, and then he has his eye on the Space Force. As Ian says, most people look up at space. I want to look down on the world. <laughs> but sitting behind Ian tonight, is his greatest hero of them all. Charles McGee was born in Cleveland, Ohio, one century ago. Charles is one of the last surviving Tuskegee Airmen, the first black fighter pilots, and he also happens to be Ian's great-grandfather. <laughs> Incredible story. After more than 130 combat missions in World War II, he came back home to a country still struggling for civil rights and went on to serve America in Korea and Vietnam. On December 7th, Charles celebrated his 
100th birthday. A few weeks ago, I signed a bill promoting Charles McGee to Brigadier General. And earlier today, I pinned the stars on his shoulders in the Oval Office. General McGee, our nation salutes you. Thank you, sir. From the Pilgrims to the Founders, from the soldiers at Valley Forge to the marchers at Selma, and from President Lincoln to the Reverend Martin Luther King, Americans have always rejected limits on our children's future. Members of Congress, we must never forget that the only victories that matter in Washington are victories that deliver for the American people. The people are the heart of our country. Their dreams are the soul of our country. And their love is what powers and sustains our country. We must always remember that our job is to put America first. The next step forward in building an inclusive society is making sure that every young American gets a great education and the opportunity to achieve the American dream. Yet for too long, countless American children have been trapped in failing government schools. To rescue these students, 18 states have created school choice in the form of opportunity scholarships. The programs are so popular that tens of thousands of students remain on a waiting list. One of those students is Janiah Davis, a fourth grader from Philadelphia. Janiah. Janiah's mom, Stephanie, is a single parent. She would do anything to give her daughter a better future. But last year, that future was put further out of reach when Pennsylvania's governor vetoed legislation to expand school choice to 50,000 children. Janiah and Stephanie are in the gallery. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here with your beautiful daughter. Thank you very much. But, Janiah, I have some good news for you, because I am pleased to inform you that your long wait is over. I can proudly announce tonight that an Opportunity Scholarship has become available. It's going to you, and you will soon be heading to the school of your choice. Now I call on Congress to give one million American children the same opportunity Janiah has just received. Pass the Education Freedom Scholarships and Opportunities Act 
because no parent should be forced to send their child to a failing government school. Every young person should have a safe and secure environment in which to learn and to grow. For this reason, our magnificent First Lady has launched the Be Best initiative to advance a safe, healthy, supportive, and drug-free life for the next generation, online, in school, and in our communities. Thank you, Melania, for your extraordinary love and profound care for America's children. Thank you very much. My administration is determined to give our citizens the opportunities they need, regardless of age or background. Through our pledge to American workers, over 400 companies will also provide new jobs and education opportunities to almost 15 million Americans. My budget also contains an exciting vision for our nation's high schools. Tonight, I ask Congress to support our students and back my plan to offer vocational and technical education in every single high school in America. <laughs> to expand equal opportunity, I am also proud that we achieved record and permanent funding for our nation's historically black colleges and universities. A good life for American families also requires the most affordable, innovative, and high-quality health care system on Earth. Before I took office, health insurance premiums had more than doubled in just five years. I moved quickly to provide affordable alternatives. Our new plans are up to 60 percent less expensive and better. I have also made an ironclad pledge to American families. We will always protect patients with pre-existing conditions. <laughs> and we will always protect your Medicare, and we will always protect your Social Security, always. The American patient should never be blindsided by medical bills. That is why I signed an executive order requiring price transparency. <laughs> Many experts believe that transparency, which will go into full effect at the beginning of next year, will be even bigger than health care reform. It will save families massive amounts of money for substantially better care. But as we work to improve Americans' health care, there are those who want to take away your health care, take away your doctor, and abolish private insurance entirely. 132 lawmakers in this room have endorsed legislation to impose a socialist takeover of our health care system wiping out the private health insurance plans of 180 million very happy Americans. To those watching at home tonight, I want you to know 
We will never let socialism destroy American health care. Over 130 legislators in this chamber have endorsed legislation that would bankrupt our nation by providing free taxpayer-funded health care to millions of illegal aliens, forcing taxpayers to subsidize free care for anyone in the world who unlawfully crosses our borders. These proposals would raid the Medicare benefits of our seniors and that our seniors depend on while acting as a powerful lure for illegal immigration. That is what is happening in California and other states. Their systems are totally out of control, costing taxpayers vast and unaffordable amounts of money. If forcing American taxpayers to provide unlimited free health care to illegal aliens sounds fair to you, then stand with the radical left. But if you believe that we should defend American patients and American seniors, then stand with me and pass legislation to prohibit free government health care for illegal aliens. This will be a tremendous boon to our already very strongly guarded southern border where, as we speak, a long, tall, and very powerful wall is being built. We have now completed over 100 miles and have over 500 miles fully completed in a very short period of time. Early next year, we will have substantially more than 500 miles completed. My administration is also taking on the big pharmaceutical companies. We have approved a record number of affordable generic drugs, and medicines are being approved by the FDA at a faster clip than ever before. And I was pleased to announce last year that for the first time in 51 years, the cost of prescription drugs actually went down. And working together, Congress can reduce drug prices substantially from current levels. I've been speaking to Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa and others in Congress in order to get something on drug pricing done and done quickly and properly. I'm calling for bipartisan legislation that achieves the goal of dramatically lowering prescription drug prices. Get a bill on my desk, and I will sign it into law immediately. With unyielding commitment, we are curbing the opioid epidemic. Drug overdose deaths declined for the first time in nearly 30 years. Among the state's hardest hit, Ohio is down 22 percent, Pennsylvania is down 18 percent, Wisconsin is down 10 percent, and we will not quit until we have beaten the opioid epidemic once and for all. <laughs> Protecting Americans' health also means fighting infectious diseases. We are coordinating with the Chinese government and working closely together on the coronavirus outbreak in China. My administration will take all necessary steps to safeguard our citizens from this threat. 
We have launched ambitious new initiatives to substantially improve care for Americans with kidney disease, Alzheimer's, and those struggling with mental health. And because Congress was so good as to fund my request, new cures for childhood cancer, and we will eradicate the AIDS epidemic in America by the end of this decade. Almost every American family knows the pain when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Here tonight is a special man, beloved by millions of Americans, who just received a stage 4 advanced cancer diagnosis. This is not good news, but what is good news is that he is the greatest fighter and winner that you will ever meet, Rush Limbaugh. Thank you for your decades of tireless devotion to our country. And Rush, in recognition of all that you have done for our nation, the millions of people a day that you speak to and that you inspire, and all of the incredible work that you have done for charity, I am proud to announce tonight that you will be receiving our country's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I will now ask the First Lady of the United States to present you with the honor, please. Rush and Catherine, congratulations. Thank you, Catherine. As we pray for all who are sick, we know that America is constantly achieving new medical breakthroughs. In 2017, doctors at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City delivered one of the earliest premature babies ever to survive. Born at just 21 weeks and six days and weighing less than a pound, Ellie Schneider was a born fighter. Through the skill of her doctors and the prayers of her parents, little Ellie kept on winning the battle of life. Today, Ellie is a strong, healthy two-year-old girl sitting with her amazing mother, Robin. In the gallery, Ellie and Robin, we are glad to have you with us tonight.
Ella reminds us that every child is a miracle of life. And thanks to modern medical wonders, 50 percent of very premature babies delivered at the hospital where Ellie was born now survive. It's an incredible thing. Thank you very much. Our goal should be to ensure that every baby has the best chance to thrive and grow just like Ellie. That is why I'm asking Congress to provide an additional $50 million to fund neonatal research for America's youngest patients. That is why I'm also calling upon members of Congress here tonight to pass legislation finally banning the late-term abortion of babies. Whether we are Republican, Democrat, or Independent, surely we must all agree that every human life is a sacred gift from God. As we support America's moms and dads, I was recently proud to sign the law providing new parents in the federal workforce paid family leave, serving as a model for the rest of the country. Now I call on Congress to pass the Bipartisan Advancing Support for Working Families Act, extending family leave to mothers and fathers all across our nation. Forty million American families have an average $2,200 extra thanks to our child tax credit. I've also overseen historic funding increases for high-quality child care, enabling 17 states to help more children, many of which have reduced or eliminated their wait lists altogether. And I sent Congress a plan with a vision to further expand access to high-quality child care and urge you to act immediately. To protect the environment, days ago, I announced that the United States will join the One Trillion Trees Initiative, an ambitious effort to bring together government and private sector to plant new trees in America and all around the world. We must also rebuild America's infrastructure. I ask you to pass Senator John Barrasso's highway bill to invest in new roads, bridges, and tunnels all across our land. I'm also committed to ensuring that every citizen can have access to high-speed Internet, including and especially in rural America. A better tomorrow for all Americans also requires us to keep America safe. That means supporting the men and women of law enforcement at every level, including our nation's heroic ICE officers.
Last year, our brave ICE officers arrested more than 120,000 criminal aliens charged with nearly 10,000 burglaries, 5,000 sexual assaults, 45,000 violent assaults, and 2,000 murders. Tragically, there are many cities in America where radical politicians have chosen to provide sanctuary for these criminal, illegal aliens. In sanctuary cities, local officials order police to release dangerous criminal aliens to prey upon the public instead of handing them over to ICE to be safely removed. Just 29 days ago, a criminal alien freed by the sanctuary city of New York was charged with the brutal rape and murder of a 92-year-old woman. The killer had been previously arrested for assault, but under New York sanctuary policies, he was set free. If the city had honored ICE's detainer request, his victim would still be alive today. The state of California passed an outrageous law declaring their whole state to be a sanctuary for criminal, illegal immigrants, a very terrible sanctuary with catastrophic results. Here is just one tragic example. In December 2018, California police detained an illegal alien with five prior arrests, including convictions for robbery and assault. But as required by California's sanctuary law, local authorities released him. Days later, the criminal alien went on a gruesome spree of deadly violence. He viciously shot one man going about his daily work. He approached a woman sitting in her car and shot her in the arm and in the chest. He walked into a convenience store and wildly fired his weapon. He hijacked a truck and smashed into vehicles, critically injuring innocent victims. One of the victims is a terrible, terrible situation died, 51-year-old American named Rocky Jones. Rocky was at a gas station when this vile criminal fired eight bullets at him from close range, murdering him in cold blood. Rocky left behind a devoted family, including his brothers, who loved him more than anything else in the world. One of his grieving brothers is here with us tonight. Jody, would you please stand? Jody. Thank you. Jody, our hearts weep for your loss, and we will not rest until you have justice. Senator Tom Tillis has introduced legislation to allow Americans like Jody to sue sanctuary cities and states when a loved one is hurt or killed as a result of these deadly practices. I ask Congress to pass the Justice for Victims of Sanctuary Cities Act immediately. The United States of America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. In the last three years, ICE has arrested over 5,000 wicked human traffickers, and I have signed nine pieces of legislation to stamp out the menace of human trafficking domestically and all around the globe. My administration has undertaken an unprecedented effort to secure the southern border of the United States. Before I came into office, if you showed up illegally on our southern border and were arrested, you were simply released and allowed into our country, never to be seen again. My administration has ended catch and release. If you come illegally, you will now be promptly removed from our country. 
Very importantly, we entered into historic cooperation agreements with the governments of Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. As a result of our unprecedented efforts, illegal crossings are down 75 percent since May, dropping eight straight months in a row. And as the wall rapidly goes up, drug seizures rise, and the border crossings are going down and going down very rapidly. Last year, I traveled to the border in Texas and met Chief Patrol Agent Raul Ortiz. Over the last 24 months, Agent Ortiz and his team have seized more than 200,000 pounds of poisonous narcotics, arrested more than 3,000 human smugglers, and rescued more than 2,000 migrants. Days ago, Agent Ortiz was promoted to Deputy Chief of Border Patrol, and he joins us tonight. Chief Ortiz, please stand. A grateful nation thanks you and all of the heroes of Border Patrol and ICE. Thank you very much. Thank you. To build on these historic gains, we are working on legislation to replace our outdated and randomized immigration system with one based on merit, welcoming those who follow the rules, contribute to our economy, support themselves financially, and uphold our values. With every action, my administration is restoring the rule of law and reasserting the culture of American freedom. Working with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell — thank you, Mitch — and his colleagues in the Senate, we have confirmed a record number of 187 new federal judges to uphold our Constitution as written. This includes two brilliant new Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. Thank you. And we have many in the pipeline. <laughs> My administration is also defending religious liberty, and that includes the constitutional right to pray in public schools. In America, we don't punish prayer. We don't tear down crosses. We don't ban symbols of faith. We don't muzzle preachers and pastors. In America, we celebrate faith. We cherish religion. We lift our voices in prayer, and we raise our sights to the glory of God. Just as we believe in the First Amendment, we also believe in another constitutional right that is under siege all across our country. So long as I am President, I will always protect your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. In reaffirming our heritage as a free nation, we must remember that America has always been a frontier nation. Now we must embrace the next frontier, America's manifest destiny in the stars. I am asking Congress to fully fund the Artemis program, 
to ensure that the next man and the first woman on the moon will be American astronauts, using this as a launching pad to ensure that America is the first nation to plant its flag on Mars. My administration is also strongly defending our national security and combating radical Islamic terrorism. Last week, I announced a groundbreaking plan for peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Recognizing that all past attempts have failed, we must be determined and creative in order to stabilize the region and give millions of young people the chance to realize a better future. Three years ago, the barbarians of ISIS held over 20,000 square miles of territory in Iraq and Syria. Today, the ISIS territorial caliphate has been 100 percent destroyed, and the founder and leader of ISIS, the bloodthirsty killer known as al-Baghdadi, is dead. We are joined this evening by Carl and Marcia Mueller. After graduating from college, their beautiful daughter, Carla, became a humanitarian aid worker. She once wrote, some people find God in church, some people find God in nature, some people find God in love. I find God in suffering. I've known for some time what my life's work is using my hands as tools to relieve suffering. In 2013, while caring for suffering civilians in Syria, Kayla was kidnapped, tortured, and enslaved by ISIS and kept as a prisoner of al-Baghdadi himself. After more than 500 horrifying days of captivity, al-Baghdadi murdered young, beautiful Kayla. She was just 26 years old. On the night that U.S. Special Forces operations ended al-Baghdadi's miserable life, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, received a call in the Situation Room. He was told that the brave men of the elite Special Forces team that so perfectly carried out the operation had given their mission a name, Task Force 814. It was a reference to a special day August 14th, Kayla's birthday. Carl and Marcia, America's warriors never forgot Kayla, and neither will we. Thank you. Every day, America's men and women in uniform demonstrate the infinite depth of love that dwells in the human heart. One of these American heroes was Army Staff Sergeant Christopher Hake. On his second deployment to Iraq in 2008, Sergeant Hake wrote a letter to his one-year-old son, Gage. I will be with you again, he wrote to Gage. I will teach you to ride your first bike, build your first sandbox, watch you play sports, and see you have kids also. I love you, son. Take care of your mother. I am always with you, Daddy. On Easter Sunday of 2008, Chris was out on patrol in Baghdad when his Bradley fighting vehicle was hit by a roadside bomb. That night, he made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Sergeant Haig now rests in eternal glory in Arlington. And his wife, Kelly, is in the gallery tonight, joined by their son, who is now a 13-year-old 
and doing very, very well. To Kelly and Gage, Chris will live in our hearts forever. He is looking down on you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much. The terrorist responsible for killing Sergeant Haig was Kasim Soleimani, who provided the deadly roadside bomb that took Chris's life. Soleimani was the Iranian regime's most ruthless butcher, a monster who murdered or wounded thousands of American service members in Iraq. As the world's top terrorist, Soleimani orchestrated the deaths of countless men, women, and children. He directed the December assault and went on to assault. U.S. forces in Iraq was actively planning new attacks when we hit him very hard. And that's why, last month, at my direction, the U.S. military executed a flawless precision strike that killed Soleimani and terminated his evil reign of terror forever. Our message to the terrorists is clear. You will never escape American justice. If you attack our citizens, you forfeit your life. In recent months, we have seen proud Iranians raise their voices against their oppressive rulers. The Iranian regime must abandon its pursuit of nuclear weapons, stop spreading terror, death, and destruction, and start working for the good of its own people. Because of our powerful sanctions, the Iranian economy is doing very, very poorly. We can help them make a very good and short-time recovery. It can all go very quickly, but perhaps they are too proud or too foolish to ask for that help. We are here. Let's see which road they choose. It is totally up to them. As we defend American lives, we are working to end America's wars in the Middle East. In Afghanistan, the determination and valor of our warfighters has allowed us to make tremendous progress, and peace talks are now underway. I am not looking to kill hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan, many of them totally innocent. It is also not our function to serve other nations as law enforcement agencies. These are warfighters that we have, the best in the world, and they either want to fight to win or not fight at all. We are working to finally end America's longest war and bring our troops back home. War places a heavy burden on our nation's extraordinary military families, especially spouses like Amy Williams from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and her two children, six-year-old Eliana and three-year-old Rowan. Amy works full-time and volunteers countless hours helping other military families. For the past seven months, she has done it all while her husband, Sergeant First Class Townsend Williams, is in Afghanistan on his fourth deployment in the Middle East. Amy's kids haven't seen their father's face in many months. Amy, your family's sacrifice makes it possible for all of our families to live in safety and in peace, and we want to thank you. Thank you, Amy.
But Amy, there is one more thing. Tonight, we have a very special surprise. I am thrilled to inform you that your husband is back from deployment. He is here with us tonight, and we couldn't keep him waiting any longer. Welcome home, Sergeant Williams. Thank you very much. As the world bears witness tonight, America is a land of heroes. This is a place where greatness is born, where destinies are forged, and where legends come to life. This is the home of Thomas Edison and Teddy Roosevelt, of many great generals, including Washington, Pershing, Patton, and MacArthur. This is the home of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, Harriet Tubman, the Wright brothers, Neil Armstrong, and so many more. This is the country where children learn names like Wyatt Earp, Davy Crockett, and Annie Oakley. This is the place where the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth and where Texas Patriots made their last stand at the Alamo. the beautiful, beautiful Alamo. The American nation was carved out of the vast frontier by the toughest, strongest, fiercest, and most determined men and women ever to walk on the face of the Earth. Our ancestors braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the Wild West, lifted millions from poverty, disease, and hunger, vanquished tyranny and fascism, ushered the world to new heights of science and medicine, laid down the railroads, dug out the canals, raised up the skyscrapers, and, ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors built the most exceptional republic ever to exist in all of human history, and we are making it greater than ever before. This is our glorious and magnificent inheritance. We are Americans. We are pioneers. We are the pathfinders. We settled the new world. We built the modern world. And we change history forever by embracing the eternal truth that everyone is made equal by the hand of Almighty God. America is the place where anything can happen. America is the place where anyone can rise. 
And here, on this land, on this soil, on this continent, the most incredible dreams come true. This nation is our canvas, and this country is our masterpiece. We look at tomorrow and see unlimited frontiers just waiting to be explored. Our brightest discoveries are not yet known. Our most thrilling stories are not yet told. Our grandest journeys are not yet made. The American age, the American epic, the American adventure has only just begun. Our spirit is still young. The sun is still rising. God's grace is still shining. And my fellow Americans, the best is yet to come. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you very much. He ripped the speech in half. We're live, guys. We're, we're reacting live to what okay. looks like Nancy Pelosi uh, ripping, uh, Trump's, ripping Trump's speech in half because apparently the great American comeback, low unemployment, military dads arriving, and uh, advancements made in uh, technology and healthcare and, and science is worth ripping. You know, I, I don't care if you look, if Obama gave his speech, you don't do that. You're the Speaker of the House, and you, you rip the State of the Union speech in half. It's petty. It's childish. It's, you know, they talk about decorum right. in the House. Yeah. This is beneath the House. Well, but they, it shows you the pettiness of Nancy Pelosi. But they always talk about how a president should be presidential. Well, they're and the president, adults in the room. Right. They're always on the moral high ground and taking the high road. And they always say that President Trump isn't presidential. Well, look at their behavior right here. Nancy Pelosi did this. For an hour and a half. That's what she did. Yeah, she licked her dentures, her. didn't smile, and shuffled her papers. We, we expected that. And, you know, that is, to be fair, it is common for, you know, as Bill said, it, we've watched these State of the Unions. It's common for the, the other, the opposing side, not to stand for everything, especially things they're critical of. But uh, the, the way the Democrats aren't standing for things, and w when we say oftentimes that the Democrats don't seem to root for the American people and they say, oh, that's a lie, it's like you guys evidence it over and over again, whether it's cheering for a recession or not standing when we talk about low unemployment rate for really all groups, including minorities, for disabled Americans. School for about uh, underprivileged neonatal, children. Neonatal research, which right. is not a partisan issue. A baby in the womb is not a partisan issue when it comes to research to help them being born or help treat diseases ahead of extra, you know, ahead of their birth. I, I just mean, don't think it, it looks good, but I, I think that you, all you're doing is giving ammunition right. to Trump supporters and to Republicans to say you don't you don't cheer for the American people. Yeah, that's a, look, that's a danger. As I said in the beginning, the key for a president is to try to force the other side either into applauding what you're for or looking bad by not doing it. If I were advising any minority party, anyone who's not the party of the president, I would just say cheer, you can cheer tepidly, just have a smile and just cheer lightly because no one will remember that, but they will remember a sour move mm -hmm. or something you say. Frankly, I thought it might be, I thought there might be greater signs of disrespect than, than we dissolved. saw. And I, I think the danger on the Republican side is um, we shouldn't let any of this overcome. I think the president killed it tonight. He, he, well, yeah, he yeah. did exactly what he had to do. That speech was forward-looking, mm -hmm. positive, and, and presidential. Yeah. And I think he did an excellent job. And if you looked at the reaction of the Republicans, he didn't just please them. Say he, he inspired them. You know, there was a lot of raucous cheers for life, for the, for, the, for the soldiers, for the Second Amendment. There was a lot there. there well, was a lot of this was in their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Not just a vision, you know, he stated things that actually have been done. That makes it difficult for the Democrats to say anything they're going to, but it makes it difficult for them to come out and say, well, he was just lying to you. We saw some of the texts that came in well, been that I got that. from they've the been DNC. Saying that all along. I mean, those are, those are the well, look, the, the biggest thing is just as the president standing there in the people's house, when he talked about killing Soleimani, right. that is something only a commander in chief could do. It makes 
makes a lot of other people look small. And that was a big step. Mm -hmm. And it was a big step, not just technically, but for a president to take that step. He took it, he was criticized, the predictions of Armageddon. And this is the kind of thing on that night, it, no one can match that. You can't match that unless you're a commander in chief. And the way that he handled that specific moment tonight, I thought was also really right. well done with having the family there. And he pointed out how Soleimani tortured her for many years and then killed her. And it's like, this guy is a bad guy. He wasn't just some Yeah, I think that was Baghdadi that he was talking oh, about yes. Kayla. Yeah. But I think the other soldier that yes, was killed and, and uh, the widow, I think, that was there. Oh, yes, the other was well soldier was well. killed by an IED. He by, made it by real. Yes. He made it real. He, he made, made the point real. is that American life, that there will be a consequence to messing with American life. And a real consequence is not a promise or just a threat, he delivered. He said, he, he, it, exactly, and he said, if you come after us, you will forfeit your life. But, you know, when he's talking about we should be putting America first, and that I, I know that that's his slogan, the Democrats don't particularly like no. that, but how do you not clap for putting America, you, right. you are, in fact, even if you're a Democrat, aren't you supposed to be running for the support and for the, the betterment of the American people? I don't get when we say we're always gonna put Americans first, and they're like, no. Not today. Look, I worked for President Bush, and, and I watched him suffer during those Iraq and uh, Afghan wars. And I was there um, when he delivered his surge speech. No one wanted to hear it. It was a gutsy move. And he did a lot of stuff and didn't get credit for it. But when Barack Obama got bin Laden, I, I applauded. Oh, and I think sure? most of the people, uh, I think all the people on the Bush team applauded. That was a good thing for our nation to and get that world. guy, right? But we, we know how they've been reacting. It to wasn't a partisan got, thing. That got was, it. you got a man that, that, that had taken American life and it eluded justice. That was a good thing. You would, you would think that um, Democrats could think it was a good thing to get Soleimani. They're having an identity crisis. They don't even know who they are. They do. They know exactly who they are. They hate Donald Trump. That's period. all they know. But well, there is one thing. One thing that he talked about. I believe. I wholeheartedly believe this president is the president because of his his tough stance on immigration running in 2015, 2016. I believe that that's what fired people up. People chanted, build that wall. That is what fired up the base to get out and vote like they never voted before. Mm -hmm. For him to go back and to talk about immigration again tonight, I thought was an incredibly smart move. We do have a clip of him talking about not only sanctuary cities, but also calling out the Democrats for wanting to provide health care to illegal aliens that would also rob actual Americans of benefits that they may need. So if we have that clip, Let's take a look and remind everyone our president's stance on uh, Americans over illegals. Tragically, there are many cities in America where radical politicians have chosen to provide sanctuary for these criminal illegal aliens. In sanctuary cities, local officials order police to release dangerous criminal aliens to prey upon the public instead of handing them over to ICE to be safely removed. The state of California passed an outrageous law declaring their whole state to be a sanctuary for criminal illegal immigrants, a very terrible sanctuary with catastrophic results. I ask Congress to pass the Justice for Victims of Sanctuary Cities Act immediately. The United States of America should be a sanctuary for law-abiding Americans, not criminal aliens. Also so important because I think just last night Elizabeth Warren was talking about uh, illegal aliens and, and thanking them, mm -hmm. really. Oh, yeah. Um, this is just such a juxtaposition. It's, it's America first and Americans first over Democrats who want to fund, encourage, shield, coddle illegal aliens. And uh, I think this president was smart to go back to that, even though the Democrats have, they've kind of stopped talking about the cages because they wanted to talk about impeachment. They'll go back to the cages, the caged children and the border. But question for you, Bill and, and David, because you guys have seen more State of the Unions. Not a, not an ageist comment, but then Aaron and I, I'm just wondering this because I, okay with that. I, am only, I am only 27 years old, so I haven't seen as many State of the Unions as, as you fellows have. But for me, and just in this country as a whole, I thought that it was a bipartisan thing to respect law mm -hmm. enforcement. And these people have said over and over again they want to eliminate ICE, they want to eliminate Border Patrol, they want to have sanctuary for illegals, and when he's talking about our brave law enforcement officers, of course they're not clapping for that. It, was there a time when the Democrats just respected law enforcement? I mean, I, I thought that that was maybe, is that just so far gone? Well, it's not just law enforcement. I think what was the uh, heart of his appeal was uh, being against the lawlessness of 
of a lot of the uh, illegal immigration. Look, I'm the father of three immigrants, three, three dots of girls uh, from China. I'm pro-immigrant, but legal immigrant. And you know, um, not this Christmas, but the Christmas before I was out in California, and right at Christmas there was a murder, and it was Ronald a poli Sink. police officer from Fiji, right, with a young baby mm -hmm. and a young oh, wife, tragic. an immigrant who came here and joined law enforcement, and he was killed by an illegal alien from Mexico. I want more guys like the police officer from right. Fiji, and no guys like the guy from Mexico that came and killed him. I don't think that that's hard, and I think people are tired of the lawlessness, and especially sanctuary cities, the official lawlessness, that your policy is going to be lawless. Well, and I think this is also directly to Nancy, David, because she is a representative of California, even though she San sometimes Francisco forgets especially. that, yeah. and it's such, a, it's such a place that's in ruin right now. And I think also with her behind him talking about a sanctuary state and talking about lawlessness. I mean, California's a poster child for that. Did it, did it sink into anybody? Did, did anybody no notice that on well, the Democratic side that might be problematic? Here's something, uh, and from the guys that have uh, seen a few more State of the Unions, and from someone that's worked within areas of law enforcement for a long, long time, what the Democrats have done now is reveal themselves publicly and more publicly. But if you go back to the policies and you use any of these major cities, New York, Chicago, Baltimore and others, and you look at the policies that go back decades, whether it's Dinkins in New York, many other failures up to de Blasio now, the policies were always there to hinder law enforcement. Taking back New York City, Mayor Giuliani's real, I mean, talk about one of the great mm -hmm. successes in law enforcement was about restoring law and order and giving the, these agencies the chance to do their jobs. And the president tonight highlighted Maria Fuerte, the 92-year-old woman who was sexually assaulted, left in 32-degree temperature to die half-clothed by a 21-year-old Guyanese illegal alien, Reyes Khan. Puts a fine point on it that this is what happens when all those policies come to fruition, whether it's this release policy under Governor Cuomo in New York. But this is not new. They've just revealed themselves. They've been empowered by the hardcore left. And if you want to destroy America, you know what you do? You take down the culture. You affect the community. You break it apart. When you do that, you begin that march. You had one Guido in there tonight. The, the elected president of Venezuela. The fact is that Venezuela went down that path of lawlessness to where it is today. You see this in societies. The president said it in 2019, he reinforced it tonight with Juan Guaido there, that law and order, not the breakdown of culture, society under socialism. And look at who's leading these cities, socialists. Outright communists. Do you think that's, Aaron, do you think that's making a connection, especially to, to young people, when we look at, and we had the State of the Union even bringing up uh, socialism again tonight, which he has in the past, will never be a socialist nation, bringing up some of uh, the real world examples of where socialism has failed, because it has in every instance. Do you think young people are going to make the connection, or are we just lost puppies at this point? You know, I think there's a great divide amongst young people as well. And the misconception is that our younger generations the millennials specifically are pro-socialism. And the more you look around these college campuses, that is not true at all. The Republicans and the more moderate folk are just silenced, but they are not submissive. So I do believe President Trump's message is resonating with that younger generation, and they are finding ways to empower themselves. And there are various youth organizations nationwide on college campuses and in high school that are making this their duty to make sure that people like us, people that support President Trump, people that support free markets, democracy, capitalism, and the Constitution have a voice and have a future. I want to talk about someone who also has a, a very loud voice and has had a loud voice in, in radio for many of us growing up with Rush Limbaugh and, and counting Rush Limbaugh as one of the great conservative voices really of our time. Having Rush there tonight, you know, we know that the Democrats are not particularly fond of Rush, right. Bill, but uh, we have that moment where we're playing. It was such a, a special moment for him. And it was one that I don't care who you are. I mean, it, the man is suffering from cancer and watching him receive the Medal of Freedom. Um, we have, we have it and we want to play it because it was so beautiful. Almost every American family knows the pain when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Here tonight is a special man, beloved by millions of Americans, 
who just received a stage 4 advanced cancer diagnosis. This is not good news, but what is good news is that he is the greatest fighter and winner that you will ever meet. Rush Limbaugh, thank you for your decades of tireless devotion to our country. And Rush, in recognition of all that you have done for our nation, the millions of people a day that you speak to and that you inspire, and all of the incredible work that you have done for charity, I am proud to announce tonight that you will be receiving our country's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I will now ask the First Lady of the United States to present you with the honor, please. So a beautiful moment. David, you have something to uh, share? Andy, Rush's cousin, and we've all known each other a long time, known Rush since he started. We were exchanging messages, and this is what he said to me, just for everyone out there about his family. Uh, Andy says, I'm weeping like crazy. I'm so damn proud of him. And uh, David, Rush's brother, at least his wife and the family, Rush's uncle, the two older brothers, are all down in Cape Girardeau. It totally surprised to the whole family and uh, to the world, thanks for thinking of us. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, it was that's, an amazing moment. I mean, it, it's moment. nice to see a president, and it's nice to just see, you know, conservative hosts be recognized. And of course, I'm sure this isn't the first time somebody has done something like this, but at least in the State of the Unions I've watched, I've not seen conservative mm -hmm. hosts of anything. We well, take so much crap. Well, you mentioned, I mean, uh, there's, there's some, some similarities between the president and, and Rush Limbaugh. Um, Rush has taken a lot of heat mm -hmm. oh, for yeah. saying a lot of names, people writing books about him, and he, he doesn't do it. Aaron was mentioning, how do you teach this young gen? No one has done more to teach the American people about free markets, right. freedom, mm -hmm. than Rush Limbaugh. And he does it in a way he never, I mean, one of the things that makes his show work, I think, is he doesn't look down on his people. No. He treats them with respect. And he engages them, and uh, and that's why people love him. And he also, you know, you see, you, you always said this over the years, it's the Rush Limbaugh show. He knows how to inform and entertain. He knows how to do right. this. I mean, his stagecraft, what he's taught a lot of people in this business. And he always said, you know, don't try to imitate me, basically. Be yourself. Right. Uh, you know, I've been at this for 32 years, and I switched to talk, wow, I guess 20 years ago. But but Rush went in there when nobody really did this, and he opened right. those well, he, doors. He charted a path. He was an entrepreneur. Yeah. He changed the industry. If you think about it, he changed talk radio significantly 
by stepping out there when it wasn't done and made it successful. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have tried to be him, but follow his advice. And a lot you. of people who are too afraid to talk about their own values and their own conservatism or whatever beliefs they may hold, listen to Rush and they live through him and they're able to find that within him. And I think we're all sitting here on, right. on Fox Nation because of people like Rush. So right. for him to be recognized tonight was a beautiful moment. He, um, he inspired a lot of younger people to get into politics and to be genuinely interested and to in be politics. Proud of what they believe in. I mean, me, me personally, I had an opportunity when I was at another network to speak with Rush at the tail end of that and I did an interview with him for his Limbaugh letter and it was such an honor to me because I grew up listening to Rush of course my whole family but just he's so he's so genuine and he's so kind and to me just such a mentor. Well, and also the, the beauty of the moment is that um, when the medal is put on him you know that to him he's a famous man he's a wealthy man but that means something to him mm -hmm. probably more than er everything else it so people can real. see that yeah. Yeah, he, see it, this, this means something to him because he loves America uh, with all his heart. And that's a perfect segue into really the theme of the speech tonight was loving America. This president loves the United States of America and he's got a, a laundry list of accomplishments. I know we were speaking before how, you know, when you're doing a State of the Union, it's, it's kind of tedious to list all the accomplishments. This president has so many. Um, I'm wondering, though, how the Democrats, we're not going to watch the response because none of us want to get indigestion, <laughs> but I'm wondering, with the response, what are they going to pull apart from that? How are they going to dispute concrete facts? Unemployment is historic lows. P wage growth, as you mentioned before, they're already, they're already sending out text messages. Oh, Your I, wages have a, stagnated. A, a, a list how, of right. What, what, how so what's, do they the, do it, Aaron? what's the counterpunch going to be? Like, if we watched all of the other networks, the 99% were the 1% sending well, what's over What's the them response going to be? I think it's going to be, well, it's great for some people because he gave tax cuts to the rich, right. but you guys are all, I mean, it's always just kind of like patronizing, like, but right. you guys are all still victims, guys. Maybe they'll just make fun of us using a southern accent and call us stupid again or smelly yeah. Walmart people are deplorable. Oh, I mean, look at Don yeah. Lemon. Look at look at what happened there with Rick Wilson. You've got it's a ridiculous. never Trumper, a Democrat, and a Don Lemon sitting there because I don't even know how to classify him anymore. A failed, a failed Journalist. TV host, yeah. failed show. And look at how they treat America. You're no longer just Bible clinging, you know, gun toting, deplorable, irredeemable Americans. Now you're to be caricatured and laughed at. And treat it as if you're less than, than something. Ivanka Trump tweeted out in response to that, the Democrats talk about how our country is divided and people are divisive. Then why are you going on national television laughing at half of the population? Well, and also Point the finger back at people yourself. Like, people like Bernie talk all the time about the elites and the 1% and the billionaires. Isn't and he Bernie one of them? People who, on well, TV look, making fun of they, middle America. They, it's a point you made before about the divisiveness um, Pete Buttigieg just gave us a great example over the weekend. He said that the job for the Democrats in responding to this is to galvanize people and not polarize people. Mm -hmm. That's the key to victory. But then I, I think it was Jake Tapper on a different show asked him, said, you recently suggested that all the people who voted for Trump are at best ignoring racism. Right. You know, their closet right. race. Do you think that that was painting with too broad a brush for 63 million people? And then Mr. Buttigieg answered, no. Okay. Like so they say one thing, but they behave. And the, the other thing, there's a big difference. You know, one of Mrs. Clinton's biggest mistakes was using the word deplorables. And of huge, course, they were right. ir irredeemable. But the reaction to that is, you know, on, on the right, people are so used to that. How many people embrace the word deplorable as a joke? Oh, everyone Call themselves does now. deplorable. Right? I, I'm a, yeah. right. it's, it's very hard to fight, fight humor. You know, way. if they're going to categorize all of us as these stupid racists, that the Trump movement is just because people are racist, then they're really missing the mark and they're in big, bigger trouble than they even realize because they're not understanding this phenomenon and understanding why we feel the way that we feel. We are spoken to for the first time in our lives by this president. That does not make one a racist. Well, we are forgotten Americans, but you brought up a, a race thing, which I thought was very interesting. And we always talk about the double standards, but tonight during the State of the Union, when we have the fourth grade girl, the African-American right. girl, the black girl, whatever, whatever she prefers to be referred to as from Philadelphia, and she's there, they're talking about school choice, they're talking about opportunity scholarships, which is something that you'd think would be, it's almost kind of like Cory Booker asked. Right. And they have her with her mother, and they're giving her great news, and the Democrats don't stand for that. I mean, 
Bill, normally they at least stand for the people. They at least stand right. for the guests. Yeah, so we're yeah at, we're I don't think level? the teachers unions would be very happy if you stood for that, and they might be keeping. I mean, look, the, the reason we don't have school choice girl. is because the teachers unions have a grip on the Democratic Party. A lot of their delegates are teachers, and they run someone against you in a primary if you're for school choice. So that that's a that that's a litmus show. issue. You don't think that that looked horrible. Well, I think it happened. always looks the horrible. The optics on that if, are if, horrible. If President Obama, no matter what the the girl was there for, was recognizing a young black girl, and Republicans refused to stand right. and acknowledge. What would we be called? Once right. again, ooh, ooh, call on me. We would be called racist again well, you know, and I, again I, I, I and again and again and again. I want to make something here that I, I, I think shouldn't be overlooked in this speech. We're talking about race. We're talking about the evolution of this nation. All right, you've got the retired Brigadier General, uh, Charles McGee, that was honored by the president tonight. Uh, he earned his wings in 43, a Tuskegee Airman. He flew 409 aerial fighter combat missions. You were sent home after 25 missions, 30 years of military service. He gets his stars pinned on him by the president. Right. He tosses the coin at the Super Bowl. What's this? This is an evolution from a time of racism and segregation in, in, in probably its second most egregious form, the continuation that happened after the Civil War. Jim Crow. To stand in there in the chamber today and being honored by the president of the United States, and there's a young black girl getting a shot at her future. Right. We, don't, we don't solve problems overnight in this country. We evolve mm -hmm. and things get better. And America has done an amazing job of this. And think about that, Tuskegee Airmen, oh, a hero beyond, I mean, his missions numbers are incredible. Right. Multiple times over, and a young girl. And, and when you look at that, what do you say? This country has come so far forward. But I think contrast that also to the Democrats, the way that they speak to minorities is, well, we need to help you and we need to lift you up by means of the government because you can't quite do it yourself. Meanwhile, contrast that to what President Trump is talking about with opportunity scholarships. No, we don't want to give you a handout. We don't want to give you a patronizing pat on the back. We want to give you opportunity to live the American dream. And it's just such a contrast to, oh, we owe you reparations. Right. We, owe, we owe you something because you couldn't get it yourself. Look, most black, okay, I, you know what, this is something, I'm glad, because just like you talk about millennials, Oh, are not who you perceive, you know, they're not all want to be right. socialists. The cacophony of voices leads that. What's really gone on in this country is an evolution in the black community. It, black people don't wake up every day going, mo you know, give me something. Right. There are people who do that. There are many who have gone to school, worked hard, whether it's high school, college, technical school, or whatever, and are working on their own futures. And it, it pisses me off, frankly, that for too often in this country, you know, people buy easily into that. Right. As Honestly, if you're separated and segregated by the color of your skin. The example I just gave, the young girl, the Tuskegee Airmen, those things are examples of advancement. Right. And, and this is something we need to change, how we talk about these Well, issues. one of the things, it's not wasn't in his speech, I think one of the best things the president has done is gone to the inner cities and just say, what have you got to lose? Are you happy right. with the housing you have, mm -hmm. with the crummy schools? I mean, look, if you look at, in this city, New York City, Bill de Blasio, Mr. Progressive, and look at what the African-American proficiency rates are in English and reading for fourth grade and eighth grade um, children of color. It's appalling. It's, it's, it's a scandal. And I think Donald Trump is challenging that, saying, what if you consider there's a different way? And I think more people are listening to him. I also think that that ties back to, because I do live in California, it also ties back into illegal immigration. When he right. talked about the, all the, the Democrats, I think we have the clip, but he talks about all these <laughs> Democrats want to provide health care to illegal aliens. Well, that was in that that came from the first debate. I think it was one of right. the first when they all, questions. Right, when they all raised their that hands. was an in-kind right. contribution to Donald Trump's re-election by the entire Democratic <laughs> but I mean, Party. Let's take a look at that, because he really called them out there, and I think this is when Trump shines best is when he's talking about immigration. Let's take a listen to the jab. Over 130 legislators in this chamber have endorsed legislation that would bankrupt our nation by providing free taxpayer-funded health care to millions of illegal aliens, forcing taxpayers to subsidize free care for anyone in the world who unlawfully crosses our borders. These proposals would raid the Medicare benefits of our seniors and that our seniors depend on while acting as a powerful lure 
for illegal immigration. If forcing American taxpayers to provide unlimited free health care to illegal aliens sounds fair to you, then stand with the radical left. But if you believe that we should defend American patients and American seniors, then stand with me and pass legislation to prohibit free government health care for illegal aliens. This will be a tremendous boon to our already very strongly guarded southern border, where, as we speak, a long, tall, and very powerful wall is being built. A good wall talk, but I think something that he brought up is also very important. He really gave people a choice, and the Democrats are going to say he gave them a false choice. Oh, we can do both. I live in California. You can't do both nope. because guess what you get? You get a booming homeless population. You cannot do both. You cannot help the American people and subsidize the millions of people around the world who want to come here. You can't do both. But I think that him setting that up there is going to be a really strong message. He's, all, like you said, he's referring back to the debate when they all raised their hands. Right. But, how, Bill, how do they get out of that? How do they, how do they answer that question? I don't know. They asked. The homeless problem, I think, is, is, uh, is complicated because I think a lot of the problem is mental illness. Right? A lot of the homeless. But in other words, it's not the Democratic answer, build them homes. That's a problem in California with right. the it's prices. A, this is because of the, but, but the real problem is the people, a lot of people either have criminal records, they have mental health issues, or drug both. issues. Drug issues, or, or all of those. And clearly, the liberal Democratic cities are incapable of just doing common sense things for public order. Well, what they have done is they have decriminalized um, theft. So in California, you can steal up to, I believe, nine hundred dollars a day. Prop so forty-seven and fifty-seven. Yes, of course. Yeah, and Those are so then on the streets a lot of the time. And so then you don't. And then they made everything a misdemeanor instead of a felony. So no one ends up getting arrested. No one gets mandatory drug treatment. No one gets mandatory mental health counseling. So everyone ends up basically homeless, on the street, lawless, doing whatever they want, whenever they want, and. Making it worse, people from neighboring states know I can go to California and basically do what I want, and they come from other states. It's a disaster. Well, it's California's laws disaster. making the problems worse, not better. Of course it is, but I do think that when, when they talk about, if we're using the Democratic argument that more money solves problems, right. which we know that it does not, then even if they want to make that argument, then how can you then say spending, which we're doing right now, $100 million a year on illegal immigrant health care, how can you say that... That that's going to you know help all the other problems that you need more money for. There's not if, the, if throwing money as a solution, yeah, you nice. don't have enough money to go around. But I do want to talk about how illegal immigration also impacts schools. It impacts minority communities. When you're talking mm -hmm. about reading proficiency mm -hmm. it's in California, I know I'm sure it's the same here in New York. When you inject illegal immigrants into these these school districts that are already underserved, then those kids get suffer. all the attention. Well, they let's suffer. look at the number of issues and treat it as a resource issue. Uh, states that spend billions of dollars on education and health are two of the biggest uh, problems with the illegal alien population. When you take up resources to hire, including money to hire, more teachers, more English as a second language, multiple languages, when you deal with all of these things, and unfortunately, you know, many of these kids come from non-school system countries right, where right. they don't have a they're formal education behind. structure. Right. So they're already at a disadvantage. Then you add the other component the parental part of it, the worker, the wage suppression of lower income wages in this country that are supplanted in various industries where they come in and they hire the illegals, which is why I believe we should punish the employers. Right, when absolutely. you add those components together and you suck the resources out of a community, that's how this really happens. And the Democrats, if hey, look, if throwing money at these problems, at any yeah. problem was going to solve it, then our growing federal debt Right. which is something Republicans have done very little about and have no appetite for, would have solved all of the world's problems. Well, the other issue is health. These kids come in, they've never been to a hospital or a doctor or had any vaccinations whatsoever. They come into these schools and these small children are getting crazy diseases that they've never even heard of. And a whole school ends up being almost quarantined. So, and add teacher-student major... ratio to this. What happens when you add 20%? to a school? What happens when you see, as I've seen in some school districts, you have a nicer school, kids from another town are walking over to go to that school because they don't check immigration status. You bring down what's happening in that school. This is the reality of the effects 
of illegal immigration. Nobody wants to talk about it because they just pulled the, the, the argument. But you did bring up something I think is important to pivot to, is one of the big discussions in this country right now, not only for events like the State of the Union and the Democratic debates, but just conversations that Republicans and Democrats and kitchen table politics is health care. We heard a little bit of it tonight, but Bill, what was your take? Did Pre President Trump accurately and sufficiently address I'm not sure about sufficiently. I think, he, look, it's, it's a Republican weak spot. Yeah. And ever since John McCain proved the decisive vote to, right. to, to uh, defeat a Republican effort on A total ego healthcare. play. A total right. ego but, play. Uh, but it, and it's the one area in the polls, you know, if you, if you get past Donald Trump's personal approval and ask him on specific issues like the economy, it's a lot higher. One vulnerability is health care because the Democrats keep saying we're going to make it simpler and easier. And I, I do think if there's a second term for Donald Trump, he needs to, we need to find a Republican health care plan. There's many out there. We know the principles. We know what's, what the problems are and pass it. Yeah, we need, a, we need to stop. We need to get back to the market. Hearing. The, re the Republicans failed because for the longest time, the battle between the Republicans within their own caucus was how to come up with solutions that we don't need government as a part of it. Mm -hmm. There's a role for government in legislation and making sure the rules and the environment exist. But there are Republicans who do like this. And John McCain screwed the country. Mm -hmm. Let's call it what it looked. The Republican plan wasn't that brilliant either. Right. No. But John McCain, in his last act, did what they do in Washington, which is always get even when it's your turn at mm -hmm. bat. Right. The one, you know, you, we talked before about the debate between socialism and capitalism, and the president linked that to the health care debate. Uh, and I think that's an important thing is is to link the, one of the problems we have is I think the majority of American people think that before Obamacare we had a free market in medicine right the market's always been I mean at least since the 60s the Great Society distorted by all these government interventions and we the basic thing is we don't have pricing and so forth I lived in Hong Kong the you know the free market system of the world and I used to take my kids to the doctor it'd be like 20 bucks and the top healthcare and so forth, because they had a pricing system and it worked and we've just destroyed that here. So I think that is a challenge. If Republicans can do that, that would be a, a, a big step in the right. Because everyone's worried about health, we're just spending more and more on it and they want their health. I know mine, you know, I have good coverage through this company. I have very good insurance coverage, but it's really complicated. Um, to do things and to, to file for your refunds. So people want a simple, they want it simple but clean then system. They're being marketed, well, Medicare for all, it's simpler. Right. But then they don't forget the back half of that. But right, I, right. I think that's going to be, and, no, and health care is not one of the, the sexy issues. But there was a moment, I don't know if it's a sexy moment, but <laughs> I thought it was a sexy moment. And it was at least an endearing moment and one of the best moments of the night. And I think we have a clip of it when the, the wife was surprised with her, her husband returning home um, if we have that, let's take a look at it because it was one of the best moments, I, I believe, of tonight's address. So here we have her clearly being surprised uh, with her with her husband returning. Um, four, to four tours. Four he did. tours. I, I think tours. that's just that to me speaks to re really the theme of Donald Trump too, which is America first, USA, military. We support you. We support law enforcement. Um, but then people chant USA. I don't know. Uh, I can't remember a time during any Obama State of the Unions when anyone chanted no. <laughs> USA, or if that would have been well received. Well, and the point but. that behind every soldier, sailor, airman, or marine is a family, mm -hmm. usually that are that are really stressed out. The by, families, by deployments, serve. yeah, right. and so forth. That they also serve in this. Look, there's an entire TV show to these homecomings, and uh, it's very and popular. Love for, I, I love it. popular for, right. for everybody, but you made a comment during uh, the coverage tonight when you said that this is kind of an Oprah-esque State of the Union. Uh, it was a very feel-good, and, and normally these are when it comes to the, their guests, yeah. but uh, I think Trump hit it out of the park, but what? how do the Democrats respond to, to something like this? Do they just completely gloss over it, pretend it didn't happen? Do they acknowledge it, say this was a nice moment? David, what do we, what do we Look, expect? From, from the political point, and I've got the text here from the DNC that they've been sending out, the last text was a request for a $10 donation to your point about you know turning this into money. Uh, they've just got to go to their base. They have to continue to distract and deflect because what Trump did in that kind of Oprah-esque way, if, uh, to use that term, is he made it real. The soldier, the family, 
the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, Juan Guaido, a very important part of this. We're working hard to resolve a problem that affects South and Central America. So he made this real for Americans, and all they can do is deflect. And some of the texts they sent, they flat out lie. They flat out tell you that your wages didn't go up in the first text I got. When we've seen wages go up among the middle class, close to $6,000, when we're seeing income climb, and by the way, if you want to talk about income growth and income equality, the highest percentage of rise in wages and bill, I believe, is for those lower income right. families in America. The people who need it the most when those 5 and $10 differences make a difference or $100, they're the ones seeing a rise. And the Democrats lied in that text. Are people buying it, though? Do you think people are, are Some buying of their when, base when they are. say, hey, listen, your wages have stagnated? No, consumer confidence is very high. I mean, the growth is only about 2%, but consumer confidence is uh, very high. Look, in, in a week, in a day, people are going to forget all the little aspects of it. But again, the president laid out an aspirational speech where he said, we're a great country. Uh, I have confidence that the American worker, given the freedom, can compete with anyone in the world. That's going to be the debate going forward, and the Democrats are stuck. So far, they seem to be uh, have opted for saying the recovery isn't real, it's phony, right. and it's only, only for, the for rich. rich. But those, I mean, those, those numbers about unemployment and wage gains, um, you know, they're, they're real. Well, they, by them sitting, they almost highlighted it. But another point that I, I want to talk about is something that is probably unique to a lot of Republican conservative presidents. I, I don't know. Again, Democrats may have long ago, before religion was taboo, discussed it. But uh, he talked about religious freedom tonight, and he talked about pr protecting religious freedom. We have a clip of that, and then, Aaron, I want your reaction. My administration is also defending religious liberty, and that includes the constitutional right to pray in public schools. In America, we don't punish prayer. We don't tear down crosses. We don't ban symbols of faith. We don't muzzle preachers and pastors. In America, we celebrate faith. We cherish religion. We lift our voices in prayer and we raise our sights to the glory of God. All right, so what is your, your take on, on that? Uh, again, it's something that we've got the prayer breakfast, I believe, later this week. Yeah. Teeing up for that, but it's something this president talks about often. We say we raise our sights to the glory of God. That's a beautiful thing to say, and, and it's a nice movement. These people have been ignored. Evangelicals have been shamed and ignored and treated as less than. And this president is actually standing up for those people and saying, you have a voice. The other side wants to protest and say they always have First Amendment rights to free speech. But guess what? Christian, Jews, Muslims who are law-abiding citizens, they also have those same First Amendment protections here. And the president is standing up for those people and saying, no one's First Amendment right is greater. Let's stand up for these people too. And that is a very wonderful message. It's actually a very inclusive thing when you think about it. He talked about faith. He talked about right. the broader aspects of of even called my word for the spirituality, he didn't just eliminate or list. And what they do on the left is they list. And even within the, the faith community, you know, you have the AME Church, which has some very left-wing support. They they work with some very far-left groups. I've covered them over the years. So even within the community, there's a debate here. But he's saying, look, you have a right. We're not going to cut you out of your ability to practice that. Well, we know that Nancy talks about religion, too. When she's going after Trump for impeachment, she talks about, you know, religion and the Constitution, but only in select times. Speaking of Nancy, we do have a, a, a statement from Nancy as to why she ripped up the speech. She is saying that she did it because it is uh, it was courteous thing to do, considering the alternatives. What? No. what was it was going to explode. I know what it was. It was going, and this message will self-destruct. She was waiting for it to blow up. That, that's the only logical answer. I, just, I mean, I don't know what else she's going to do with it. I, it's <laughs> what, dumb. I mean, it's they say dumb. Worse, than, worse than a crime, it's a blunder. That's dumb. You don't want to look ungracious when you're the speaker. Classless. The well, then to say it was event. courteous thing to do right. considering the alternatives. Was she going to put her dentures in it, or, or what was she going to do? I, I mean... It, it's just dumb. It's I'm so classless. It's classless and right. well, it caught my. I mean, there was Emily the thing Post that would be eyes. unhappy with that. One. <laughs> Another point that I wanted to talk about that we have clarity on was um, the shouting. Uh, we we didn't know what was happening, and we saw Nancy put her hand up. 
We didn't know what happened, and we do have clarification on that. It's the father of one of the teens killed in the Parkland shooting in 2018 stood up and shouted something from the White House gallery when uh, Donald Trump promised to pretend, protect the Second Amendment. Uh, Bill, what are your th initial thoughts on that? Well, look, people like that, um, you know, you, you cut them a little slack uh, for this, but he was brought there to make a, make a statement, right? And, um, and he did. This is what happens. And, and look, when you have a long speech like this and you have people man. come in, people get emotional, you know? Well, I'm sure they did, but I think that, we, you know, and, and... I don't think it helped. Also, look, there are, others, there are other parents of other Parkland children who were killed Andy who Pollard. have the opposite Andy position. Pollard, right. and, and he also, and he has a, a, a different, very different message. So we, we understand that it's a sensitive issue, but to go there and then... Uh, That's make not a, the time. Make a martyr out of yourself. I don't think it helps. I, you know, I obviously am on the other side of the issue, you know, pro Second Amendment and so forth. I don't, I don't think it helps. But uh, it, I'm reluctant to criticize. If if it were a congressman, I'd be much tougher. I'm reluctant to criticize. Yeah, I, 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 a father, uh, right. you know, who lost a child. Right. Well, that was one of the moments we were unsure exactly what was going on. So glad that we have the clarification right. on that. But uh, in our remaining moments, we'll just kind of go down the line. Uh, David, what was the highlight of the night and the low light of the night for you? I'm not talking I, about Trump's I, hair. I think, I think the highlight of the night is really to watch the people who were there that were what I call making it real, whether it was the Tuskegee Airmen, Rush, the father coming home from deployment to see his family, the little girl getting a future with her education. To me, those were, they combined into a highlight of making it real uh, and that the low light was really the Democrat response and the Speaker of the House. The, the fact that Nancy Pelosi finally demonstrated her classlessness, uh, right. you know, or lack of class. I don't know, did I use the right word there? Maybe somebody can self-identify it for me. But the fact is she demonstrated something that I have not seen in a Speaker of the House. And uh, I don't see what it gets her. I, I just don't, Bill. Do you think, though, along those lines, we did talk about the moment where she kind of, uh, he faked her out on the handshake. <laughs> Some are going to say, well, you wouldn't right. shake her hand, so she ripped the speech. Was it, were they equal? Was it a quid pro quo, yeah. or, was if it, you will? Was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I actually can't say much about that after a private conversation, but let's just oh, say Oh, we got some tea from <laughs> Mr. Webb. Ew. Yeah, I wish she had shaken her hand, but Me I too. think, well, I but, think being photographed ripping up a speech right after the president has appealed to the mm -hmm. people of the United States and, and, and tried to appeal to the Democrats. I, I yeah. just think that The best is well, yet look, to come. What she has I think that's done. a tasteless um, kind, of, kind of act. Yeah. But it's Trump's response is understandable. This is a woman who has been saying one thing and holding the shiv in her hand and sticking it in his back politically oh, yeah. and running this fake impeachment. You brought up a good fake point, though, whistleblowers. David. Is anybody, we, knew, we, we thought we wouldn't hear about impeachment tonight, but we didn't hear a, a thing, not even a nod to it whatsoever, which I thought was kind of surprising. I thought we'd hear like maybe just something like an insinuation, an, an innuendo, something, a nod to it. But nothing is like he almost. I forgot, would think but. every single advisor the president has has wait until after. Yeah. You've been acquitted. Get on Twitter I, later tonight, and then you can tomorrow, talk about the witch tomorrow hunt. after you've been acquitted. You <laughs> yeah. Know, why you know why do it? I think the pre I think you also look bigger. For right. everyone knows he was. Everyone impeached. knows it exactly. Yeah. So just put it past you. I mean, the whole purpose is to say you've had impeachment. We've got the business for the American people, and I'm focused. That, that certainly is in the polling is what helps Donald Trump, that the Democrats are obsessed with taking him down through impeachment in an election year, and he wants to get along with the business of the American people. Aaron, what do you think the polling is going to be after tonight? I mean, it's through the roof for President Trump because there was no negative well, do for you him. Do you think that it is going to move the dial at all, though? I mean, I mean these speeches typically, you know, you're not going to see a ton of movement from a, from a State of the Union, but do you think given the nature of his speech and also listing the accomplishments if the American people are watching, do you think those that may may have disapproved might look to this and say, yeah, that was a good speech? So Democrats, as we know from whether it was the impeachment or Brett Kavanaugh, are not going to be swayed either way. What about the independents? It's the though? independents who are the important people here. And even in the recent Gallup poll that had Trump's approval rating skyrocketing, it was also skyrocketing amongst independents. So I do believe this State of the Union will have an impact on those independents. Democrats, he could have spoken in Mandarin or Cantonese. It would not have mattered. Um, but for those independents, I do think that every moment is crucial leading up to November.
and a, a good moment for him. All wins, especially last night. I mean, impeachment failed. You can't right. get your app right in Iowa. You guys don't have a right. front runner. You've got how many people still running? I mean, you don't whittle it down. I, it's just such a This tweet a broke it down for, down for me tonight. I heard this tweet. It said, Trump just spiked the football in the Democrats' end zone, did a backflip in front of their bench, <laughs> and now he ran up into the stands and kissed the opposing quarterback's girlfriend. <laughs> I think that pretty much sums it up. I just don't want to have the image of Nick Trump kissing Nancy Pelosi. But anyway. Nancy Pelosi's <laughs> husband. The opposing We're just going with, listen, the Super Bowl girlfriend. was the other day. We're doing a little sports analogy. <laughs> Give me some, uh, you know, you see, he spiked the football. Yeah. I, I think no, it, I no, think he did. But you know what? Uh, this is an important point. Uh, as the center, the former center in the, on the panel here, Bill McGurn, you know, I like the defensive position. Uh, Defense wins championships. Ground game is what matters. And the Trump ground game tonight was take your wins, take your strengths, go forward, don't highlight your weakness with impeachment. Save that for tomorrow's game. I mean, he really did that And tonight. give your own people some confidence. I mean, yeah. when you're president, you're the party leader. A lot of these people sitting there, which way do we go? And he gave them a confident, strong message and a direction. Mm-hmm. And that's what they need. They, you know, they need a certain trumpet. Well, I know the fight song. Go fight when. What do you think? <laughs> and again, like I said, we're not going to be watching. We only have a couple minutes left. But because we're not watching the Democratic response, and I believe it is from, um, it is from a Gretchen Mich- Whitmer from Michigan, yeah. correct? Um, Gretchen Whitmer, and she has. A, I was. I, I have the Who? laundry list on Who? her. Well, le- well, I don't want the laundry list on her. But do you have any? Um, I, I, I heard her speaking this morning. <laughs> She's talking about how. Again, it, repeating the same talking points that wages are stagnating. It's not. It's a, the inequality that people at the top are seeing right. the wonderful things of Trump, but the people on the bottom are not. Is, is that what we forecast for the, the Democratic response? She's another dishonest Democrat who said she was a moderate. She's campaigned with Bernie. She's for sanctuary cities. 60% of her home state doesn't approve of the job that she's doing. When she got elected, she said she wanted to fix the damn roads. She instead just put in a gas task, tax making their gas tax the highest in the country. So she's basically a Bernie socialist who had a mask on as a blue dog Democrat, and she's back for the state, and she'll be back for the country. Well, she's given the response tonight. All right, uh, who wants the final word on, I think I think we're, we're looking at you. What, what's your final word on the my, State of the Union? We're waiting with bated breath. Because some my people final think word it'll is, be his, some people think that these are limited. Um, I am. Um, as a speechwriter, I don't just look to the words of what he said. I'm looking to the tone, and again, I think the president successfully laid out um, a story of American greatness that is rooted in the ordinary American citizen. And I think that's all those pieces fit into that. And that, I think that's a powerful narrative. And I think that's hard for the Democrats to respond to. The worst, as I say, the worst job in the world is responding to a president's State of the Union. No, ha, do you remember any response? Any I remember year? Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that was my first taste of old Lizzie Warren, and I was still in college, and I was thinking, oh, boy, who is this? Right. And she's back. But, uh, you know, maybe we'll get some actual Iowa results uh, tomorrow. We're going to have a president's going to have another victory. But, you know, this isn't even really so much about President Trump. I think tonight was about the American people. Right. It's about all the American people. Even those that think that they hate this president are doing well under this president. I think that that's a success. It is the great American comeback. It is a blue collar boom. And it is keeping it great. So that is it for us on Fox Nation, our coverage of State of the Union. You can obviously stay tuned on Fox Nation for David's show, and then you do Deep Dive as well. That's so right. all of us, Aaron, you're always on Fox I Nation. I know, I'm so here. Welcome to Fox Nation, Woo. and I'll see you for Final Thoughts tomorrow as well. Um, and uh, that is all for us. God bless, take care, and have a good night.